Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, uh, Distinguished Touch Seminar today. Uh, there are still some seats in the, well, I guess two seats in the front. Uh, so um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, David Schmois as the Distinguished uh, Touch Seminar speaker today. Uh, David was my advisor at Cornell, and uh, I think I'm more nervous in, in introducing him than he might be about giving this talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, David has been, a, as with all of his students, I mean, when he became my advisor, he also became my lifelong mentor. I've benefited immensely from his advice over the years. Um, David has had an impressive career with uh, lots of accomplishments. Uh, if I go through listing all of them, then it'll use up half of his time. So uh, I won't do that, but I will just say a few words that I think what I find quite impressive and remarkable about his career is that he's really successfully straddled both theory and applications. So he started off working in approximation algorithms made um, and still works in that. I mean, made uh, seminal contributions in scheduling and facility location problems, and then uh, some stochastic optimization problems, and I was lucky to be uh, part of that. And more recently, he's, uh, I guess, gone back to his, or he returned to one of the things that he looked at earlier, TSP. Um, but then he's also had this parallel strand of work, uh, which, uh, I mean, he was recently involved in the designing the city uh, bike sharing network in, uh, in New York City. During COVID, he was involved in planning the logistics for Cornell's operations. And I think that sort of brings has brought him closer to sort of optimization towards influencing policy, and that's part of the topic of this talk, uh, which is uh, algorithmic tools for re redistricting. So uh, please join me in welcoming David Schmois as our distinguished speaker today. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for this honor to, to, to give this talk. Um, and what I'd like to do is give a uh, a quick overview of a, a collection of work that has been going on at Cornell for over three years now. Um, and indeed, as, as, as Swami indicated, there is an um, a overlying, underlying agenda uh, to uh, be engaged in policy. And this isn't algorithmic decision making. The real goal, this isn't about trying to sort of say, here is a solution. This is around putting tools in policymakers' hands to help them make better decisions. And that's, that is the overlying objective. Um, and I hope I'll convince you of some of that along the way. So it's a little odd giving this talk in Canada because this is really about <laughs> US stupidity. And the stupidity is grounded firm, uh, fir firmly in, 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 in the US Constitution where I'll, I'll, I will read this to you because it's important in, in many of the aspects throughout the talk is that so the actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manner as they shall by law direct. Okay, so every 10 years we have to figure this all out again. Um, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed by each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations. So this means that there are 50 separately prescribed processes by which, for each state, both at the federal level, at the US Congress, um, in the House of Representatives, districts get drawn, but also at the state legislative letter level, this is again local rules rule. So this meant like, for example, in 2021, there were 428 congressional districts, 1,938 state districts, and 4,826 assembly districts, state house districts that had to be withdrawn. And the sad truth is and redrawn and redrawn again as they go through a series of court litigations. And indeed, one of the consumers of the technology that I'm gonna to talk to you about um, is litigants who want to show the courts that what you did is prima facie wrong in comparison to what could be achieved. So I'm actually gonna be talking about two papers. 
uh, one with a former undergraduate student of mine, Wes Gurney, who's now a PhD student at MIT, and one also with Wes, but with a Cornell Tech colleague, Nikhil Garg and David Rothschild. Um, the first sort of builds a larger optimization framework, and the second tries to show how an additional layer of social me uh, choice mechanism can perhaps in an even far-reaching sort of pie-in-the-sky thing of uh, view try to overcome some of the limitations of the current system. So if I think about drawing congressional districts where you have one re representative selected from each district, um, there are a question of, so what are the goals here? What are the desiderata? Um, and one vague thing which you know, can be precise, and actually there are a number of ways in which it might be implemented, is that it should be in some sense proportional. So the natural simplest view is that if a given party P has a vote share V sub P uh, of the overall vote in a state, and this is a statewide system as very much clearly delineated by the Constitution, then the resulting representation in that state should be proportional to that. Let's say the, the, the seat share, WP, should ref be re reflective of that. One thing that is truly peculiar to the US is this notion of compactness of districts. There was a sense that it, the, the whole reason we went to the stupid system is that representatives should represent their community and reflect the locality and communality of the, the people that that representative represents. And one sense of how do we define things that look bad from things that look reasonable is a, somehow a notion of compactness. And there are any number of measures and metrics that you can think about it. One, just a sort of back of the envelope thing to think about, is think about the ratio between the perimeter of a district and the area encompassed. You know, we all know how to optimize that. That's a circle, that's the sort of nice round thing. But as you think about if you've seen any of the maps that look really absurd, these long filigree districts have very long parameter, perimeter compared to the, uh, the, the area they capture. So that's one example, but there are any number of metrics that you could use. So these are two very different metrics. Here I have the state of North Carolina. This will also be a test of US geography as, as we go through various slides. Uh, that, that, that the, the map on the left for North Carolina is proportional but not very compact. You see some number of elongated districts. On the other hand, the map on the right um, is uh, compact, but not very proportional. Uh, and these aren't the only measures. You might, you know, in this age of extreme polarization in the US pol uh, electorate, want to have some notion of competitive districts to make it, you know, to what chance is there of, of uh, maybe the slightly in the minority party actually winning. Um, and you may want some notion of responsiveness, that if you increase the vote share collectively statewide, does that have, you know, what is, what's, you know, the, the change in slope, so. So there are two challenges, and one gets all of the headlines, but they're really two challenges, and one is what I'll call intentional gerrymandering. Um, this dates back to the 18th century when there was a congressman from Massachusetts who did exactly this, is the intentional drawing of maps to favor one party. And here I'll give you the most stylized, simple example to understand how this, is, this might be a thing. So imagine a completely ridiculous, absurdly simple state which has 50 precincts. Each is either blue or red, and it's 100% blue and 100% red in terms of what its population looks like. Everybody votes according to party line. Um, and that there are five districts that must be hammered out from, from this map. Um, so there, here are two possible choices. Choice number one, we um, pack all of the, or we, we, you know, sorry, I've got this, I've got my an analogy on, we crack as the power in, party in power, um, the blue party, we crack all of the red vote into nice, easy, small pieces, and now we can win all the districts and get a five-none um, split. Or we can pack, if we somehow do things foolishly, if we, given that we would think that blue should be in control, 
um, that we you know, compress so much of the blue vote into those two districts that those are the only ones that we uh, can win. Um, and so, in fact, in spite of the fact that it's a majority party, it ends up with a minority of the district. So, so this is the stylized easy example. You say, well, you're just making this up. Um, this is North, uh, North Carolina yet again um, with the map that was uh, generated um, by the North Carolina legislature and later thrown out by the court, um, where although party split is more or less 50-50, maybe 51-49 in terms of overall vote, typically in statewide elections, um, the Republicans controlled nine of the 13 districts in the previous cycle. So this is not a potential, and, and, and you know, it's not that you, yeah, there are some things, you know, you might look at this district and say, oh my God, that's a little weird, um, but, but uh, that, uh, this is a real thing, and this is, this is a, a weaponized um, competition between both parties um, overall. And ultimately, I, want, I will head, you'll forget that I ever was heading there for a while because I won't talk about it for a bit, but I, I want to think about ways in which we might actually model to have some sense of fairness and how we might think about that overall built into the system. So that was challenge one, and I will spend almost all of the talk talking about challenge one. Um, but there is another challenge, too, which I'll call natural gerrymandering. Um, where, and this was, was, was highlighted in work by Moon Duchin um, and got dubbed the Massachusetts problem, in that Massachusetts is a relatively uniformly democratic state, that the, there, there is a solid Republican minority, um, really close to 40% Republican, and yet it is hard to draw what you might look at it as a reasonable map with more than one Republican district. Um, so really a very strongly, even though, you know, they, so it's not a question of having to be an intentional gerrymander, it's just the way the distribution, the, 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 the system of representation that is embedded in the Constitution has this problem of if you, if you sort of think about um, what locality is done. So in some sense, you might need to draw unnatural maps in order to be proportional. And we'll talk about a way to address that. So now let's just get into math. Um, this is Nebraska, um, and uh, a really dull state, actually. But uh, <laughs> I'm sorry if anyone's from Nebraska. Uh, I, I meant it only algorithmically. Uh, that, uh, um, so, so we have at some level, and the, the, which level where you're working at is, is, is the different people have worked at different levels in terms of the base level of population. At the core, it is natural to think about it as what, what's often called the precinct level because that is where votes are recorded. And so you know from previous elections what the split was at a precinct level. Um, there are various other refinements. They, they align somewhat with census blocks and census blocks are a little bigger. But so there are a number of, of ways. But let's, we have some underlying block structure that we're going to use as sort of the granular base. And I can think about a related underlying undirected graph um, to uh, understand adjacency of those blocks in terms of their topography. And so we are working with this map and ultimately, and one of the constraints that is embedded into US law is that the districts need to be contiguous. Uh, in that it must be possible to walk, or not walk, traverse from any point in a district to any other point in the district without leaving the, the, the district. So of course, as we think about it from the point of view of this undirected graph, that really means that as I subdivide, Nebraska only has three districts, so if I tripartition this graph into the districts that there and the blocks that correspond to it, that means that from this uh, underlying dual graph that that means we have three connected components okay so so that's the goal and so you know a bit of notation we have a atomic set of geographic blocks B we have an adjacency graph BE with graph G um, each node has an associated population which of course will be important because another piece that's in US law and even in the Constitution embedded in a one-man one vote and equal equality of representation is that the 
districts that get constructed have to be population balanced. What that word population balance means state by state varies state by state. There are 50 different laws that actually say what that actually happens to mean. Um, constraints, we need that population balance. We need it to be contiguous. Um, we can think about a parameter epsilon sub p as being a population tolerance for how imbalanced it might be in a relative setting. Um, and we, depending on the state, there are particular implementations of what the word compact might or might not mean. Most of them are in poorly formed English and therefore completely non-mathematical concepts. Um, and uh, so that this is just part of the thing. So then you can ask, well, what's the objective? You know, are we aiming for getting, I mean, I talked about um, two desiderata, you know, this sort of notion of compactness, we should get fairness. How do we incorporate that? We'll, we'll talk about elements of that. But of course, ultimately, we just need a K partition for, if we have K districts we want. So that's the computational problem at hand. This is a hard problem. Yes, it's MP hard, but computationally, from a pragmatic point of view, not all MP-hard problems are created equal. Um, th this one is a pretty nasty one. There's a long literature um, uh, of algorithmic work embedded within two parallel um, mathematical computational cultures. Garfinkel, a student of Nemhauser at Hopkins, I think, um, that uh, wrote his PhD thesis on the problem and did early work uh, on it. So, uh, and, and there's, so there's a long line of, of sort of optimization oriented work. There's also an important thread of work that comes out of the MCMC community, the Monte, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, where one thing that has had political impact is some notion of maybe it's useful to understand maps that are being used as to whether they can be justified and provably put in the tail of some distribution over possible statewide maps. And this, for some time, though it seems now has been repudiated by the US Supreme Court, um, has been a justification um, for why certain maps should be thrown out. So in particular, the Pennsylvania case was largely argued by Jonathan Madison, Mattingly as a expert witness for the court as being failing that where it was within the, distribu within the distribution overall. Okay. Let's put our optimization hats on, okay? And let's just think, oh, let's just dream. You know, what could we do to solve this problem? Well, I claim that in any of your undergraduate optimization courses, you might have students come up with the following very simple formulation. Consider enumerating each possible individual district in an overall statewide plan, okay? Each district is, you know, a subset of blocks. We can encode that as a zero, one vector over the set of blocks. So what I want you to imagine is a column vector, which I'm depicting in a, col in, in a color-coded way, yellow meaning one, purple meaning zero, and I'm sort of depicting it with respect to this very, you know, the, the next version of a stylized state. Imagine that this is a state which has 32 blocks, four perfectly rectangular rows um, of eight districts each, and that we might just encode that as being one possible district. Um, that, you know, Gedanken experiment, feel free to dream. Um, that we just have this complete enumeration, D1 through Dn, of all such possible feasible districts. It, each DJ is simply a subset of blocks. We can have an incidence matrix A that exactly captures the concatenation of these column vectors so that a given row column tells me for a given block potential district pair, one meaning that that, that block is in that district, zero meaning that. We have a nice standard zero one formulation. And now we introduce a zero one integer variable that indicates am I gonna use that potential district and then there are only two constraints. There's a partitioning, packing kind of constraint that says that if I look at any given block, it must be contained in exactly one selected district. And of course, that's what this constraint does exactly. And then we have to choose K districts. And that's what the last line shows. So this is a classic set partitioning problem. Nothing more, nothing less, in terms of what I think about the visible space. 
And of course, we all know that that's the, 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 the rub, that we have to have some means for manipulating with that. And, uh, and of course, it's you know, badly exponential. But nonetheless, we can you know, you know, think about this as a representation of uh, how we think about this set partitioning IP. I've depicted the four possible districts that we might be using. Um, and then we're you know, color coding, and you sort of see this, that if I look at any block as a horizontal line, there's something that's colored um, in one of the colors of the districts that intersects it um, so that we solve, satisfy the set partitioning. And of course, there are four colors and four districts overall. And of course, in addition to that, we have um, population balance kinds of constraints. So slight different version of writing what that feasible region looks like that uh, no, no big change, and I don't know what's going on with, there we go. Um, so you can think of that as the feasible set, and you know, just repeating again everything I said. But I want to sort of change your perspective from a normal perspective, is say that, suppose I have some partial enumeration of the districts that I'm working over, some, some subset of, 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 of all the columns. One way of measuring how expressive that subset is, is in a notion that I'll call leverage, which is the ratio of the number of feasible solutions in that region. So the number of state, distinct statewide plans divided by the number of columns that we generate. That if I'm going to restrict myself to there, that, that this is not the only, but it is one measure that, that you might just sort of keep in mind as a guidepost, not as an necessarily objective, but just sort of a, a gut check. Um, good. So, you know, here we are in our set partitioning problem, and this is standard technology, right? That, you know, the, the, the fraction of this room that has thought about vehicle routing knows that, that, that if I think about those sets as being the points that are going to be picked up by a particular vehicle, the fact that there are an exponential number of routes and that we aren't going to enumerate them explicitly, you know, of course, we just do that. We do this thing. We use that. It's, what's the problem? Um, and indeed, we know that the kinds of LPs that underlie those IPs are the kind that we can solve fast enough and so that we can use the usual... Um, LP-based technology to solve integer programs in a practical way at scale. So you would think I must be done, but I don't know how to actually do all of those steps, and I don't see the sort of usual a few columns on the fly kind of way of actually leading to being able to get integer, integer programs of this solved. To some extent, it's the additional complexity of the kinds of constraints that what make for a feasible district that are some of the limitations. And to some extent, it's the, the, the question of if I have an, you know, a, one set of columns, adding a small number of columns doesn't necessarily help when I think about the interlocking nature, nature of, sta of a statewide plan. And so there, there, are, there are issues here. I can put it out as a challenge that, that, you know, come and use traditional technology to do something far better than, I'm, than, 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 than what I'm doing. But what I'm going to work instead is to think about how do I generate a good enough set of columns heuristically so as to produce the high, high enough quality solution that puts the tool in the decision maker's hand. So again, so this is back to North Carolina, the, the kind of picture that we're going to have two phases, we're going to generate a, a set of dis districts, and then we're just going to black box, nothing fancy, um, optimize the, with off-the-shelf integer programming technology. So we need a good solutions. We need a rich basket of districts, and of course, for tractability, we need some good algorithm that generates them in a reasonable way. So here's the idea. The, this, is, this is the main idea on one slide. What we're going to do is a recursive sub-partitioning of the state in a series of iterations um, to iteratively level of the tree by level of the tree head to the point that whereas at the top, North Carolina, at least in the previous census, had 13 representatives, at the end the regions that we're going to be represented, representing only have one representative according to that. So 
we're going to, this is going to be a randomized construction. So we're going to use the power of randomization and as a, well, we don't know what else to do. So we're going to throw randomness at it to sort of see how we can improve things. Um, that we're going to split the region, and I'll explain exactly how we do that split, but at a highest level, we're going to have a parameter which is chosen randomly of into how many subregions are we going to split. So at this top level, you can see that we split somewhere between two and five regions here. And now, as we do that split, we're also going to split the allocation of represent representatives that are associated with each region. So in effect, we're building a state, a dynamic programming kind of state state um, in which we have a region associated with a, a quantity of representation, which is then going to get subdivided multiple times at the next level into smaller regions. So that's the big idea, which isn't such a big idea. And this is going to exploit compositionality in a, in an interest, in a nice way. Um, and so, again, I'm going to think about each node being a region and a capacity. That's the number of the districts. And uh, we really just want to be able to generate this quickly. Um, we're going to do many random replications of how we do a split at each level so as to get a diversity. It shouldn't be too much so that, that complexity gets controlled. But there's sort of two key parameters, a fan out width, which just says, how many partitions am I going to generate per node? And a splitting factor, am I going to split it you know, into two or five or whatever? But it actually, we've never did anything more than five. This is the picture that explains why, in the end, we're actually generating lots of maps. So if you think about it, so imagine that this was the first split and everything was binary. We're generating potential districts for the left half with also potential districts for the right half. And any way that I can put the jigsaw puzzle together on the left-hand side will interface nicely with what we do with the, the right-hand side. And now at the next level of, of recursion, that we're splitting it the, in an analogous way, and now every quarter fits with this quarter. And so we're getting an exponential growth in terms of this leverage function that I was thinking about in the depth of the tree. So in fact, this is a, a method that actually will work better in many ways with larger number of districts. So New York, which has 200 and some odd assembly districts, um, is, is in some sense a better setting for how this works than North Carolina with its 13 congressional districts. So, so this hopefully gives you the picture. And, and indeed, this is you know, reflecting that that, that we are grow, have this exponential growth in terms of the depth. So I have to tell you next um, how we actually do the partition. So that's the key thing. I've, I've got some region, like North Carolina, and let's say I want to split it, I've decided I want to split it three ways, and I want a random mechani randomized mechanism to do that. I'm going to, in effect, choose central points for the, the, re the resulting re regions by choosing them randomly. I'm going to choose the first one, center zero, uniformly at random according to population, okay, from amongst the blocks. And now, iteratively, I'm going to choose subsequent districts to try it in a way to get me some sense of dispersion. So it's going to be sampled with respect to the product of the distances to all the centers already chosen. Currently, there's only one chosen, so the product is kind of dull, but so it's sort of now you know, proportional to the distance. And so maybe, I mean, the, you know, so clearly higher, the, the color coding shows the, the various shading of the weighting of the probabilities. Um, indeed, I chose something with some, in this random draw, I chose something with some moderate probability. And now I'm going to sample the next one. Um, and there, there's the, the, the next block, for example. So now I've, I've chosen this sort of some point of centrality. And I'm going to take out my integer programming toolkit as well. But before I do that, I'll actually run a kind of k-means trick to just say, OK, if I think about those three centers, let's do something crude to understand what fraction of the seat should go to each of those cent you know, center points? And we use that to do that. And now, given that we have that locality, we want to then figure out what the right partition is. And we've got this cut, first cut at, at how many seats. 
and we're going to get to an integer program. Okay, so let me walk you through this formulation. It's a very standard formulation, nothing great. So now the game is going to be for each block, I need to assign it to one of those central blocks. So I have a subset of the core of, of central blocks. Those are going to be indexed by I. A generic other block, J, has to be assigned, as it clearly is here. Um, to uh, um, be assigned to exactly one district. The objective function is exactly where I'm going to try to make sure that how I do this partition keeps compactness iteratively as I do this subdivision. And that's a, a standard dispersal kind of objective function. We add another little bit of randomization um, in the exponent in, in terms of how the distances, those are distances with respect to the Del and I graph um, of the dual um, between the two blocks. Um, and, and we have this sort of control to help sure that this ensures that when I'm done with the partition, they're relatively well shaped. We have a set of constraints to ensure that relative to the subpartition, we're, we're remain, maintaining population balance group by group. And then in a trick due to an early paper of George and co-authors, um, we, in, we enforce contiguity by saying that if I'm assigned to a center I, then someone whose shortest path graph distance to that, that, that point I is one closer um, as well, and that at least one of those must be uh, there as well. So this is an analogous thing that we can draw. You remember my stylized version. This is really one particular run for North Carolina, where again, each vertical stripe corresponds to a column generated. The yellows generate to the blocks that are in that district. And then we've you know, highlighted a few columns that, that, that come out overall in terms of um, what results from the, the, this approach. And as I promised, I, wasn't I didn't talk about fairness at all until now. So let's, let's get to fairness. So I want a stochastic model of fairness. I want some sense of understanding to use historical data to infer what likely outcomes should be. And what I want to do is I want to you know, have some way of capturize, capturize, good, well, capturing. Um, in some formal sense, the expected difference between the state share and the state seat share and the state um, overall vote share. And so if I, for each proposed district, use historical data to estimate both, let's just focus on one party, but let's say democratic mean vote share and variance share, and I build a statistical model to extract that kind of normal distribution, then of course there's a associated Bernoulli variable on the chance that that variable is more than a half. And that, with the linearity of expectation, allows me to have a nice closed form expression for how um, to think about what the gap is between the expected vote share and the expected seat share. So this just becomes a nice simple calculation of this relatively simple underlying model there. And, and you know, one can think about proportionality as being one piece. One thing that many people, many political sciences have advocated for is something that's known as the efficiency gap. Um, and that's also a different mapping. It's just, a, in effect, a, a straight line which re reaches um, a breakpoint um, when uh, you get between one third and two, that all the change happens between one third and two third, and, and that you have a straight line there, but then you get everything once you're sort of beyond, if you have, you don't get anything if you're less than a third and you don't get, you, you get everything if you're more than two thirds and you linearly interpolate. And again, that exactly can be captured in an, in an analogous way. So this gives us the ability to take historical data of understanding what happens and being able to estimate you know, for a given potential district, what's the probability that it'll end up electing uh, vote? And now we're back in our set partitioning mode. Um, and uh, um, now, of course, what I'm interested in is I think about the gap between seat chair and, and vote chair is not assigned, I mean, it is assigned quantity. 
But what I care is being at the minimizer of that absolute value. And so what I really want to do is minimize the um, objective function, here, the absolute value, which, of course, we all know how to do. You add an extra variable, and you, you minimize that instead. So, so we can solve that. And so here's some North Carolina pictures after doing a, a variety of runs. And uh, you can see that, you know, actually you can bang on minimize proportionality gap. Um, no problem. And that's a map that goes with it. Um, that, you know, in this world of ML, we're all used to thinking about the elbow of the trade-off curve. Um, here we're showing on one hand the proportionality gap, and here we're looking at the total district perimeter, so again, a compactness measure. And you sort of see that, that you know, while this was great for proportionality, it wasn't so great for compactness, that, that there's all, all this jaggedness. But, you know, if we go to the elbow of the trade-off curve, you see that, uh, in fact, um, we get a, a much smoother looking map. And indeed, one thing that we've done subsequently is sort of add a local search improvement kind of thing of how much can we tinker at the boundaries so as to get things. So I, I mean, I talked to one lawyer recently who was uh, part, of the, part of a case going forward, maybe, in Wisconsin. And, and he said, well, I look at your maps, and they seem too regular. And it's like, OK, you think that they look too regular? That's, that's an interesting comment. We, we can make them less regular. But again, that's, 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 you know, that's the beauty of having the, the, the tool that, that you can actually produce a, a range of outcomes. One thing that you should note is that one side benefit of, of the structure they had, if that I, subject to a given set of columns, didn't want to maximize fairness, that is, go to the, the, the midpoint of the, the, the zero point of the absolute value. But instead, I, you know, I'm a, I would put my partisan cap on. I want to bang home whichever partisan I'm for. That actually becomes a linear, uh, linearly optimizable problem over that column space. We can just use dynamic programming. That, you know, again, taking advantage of the linear ex, uh, linearity of expectation, we, we can, you know, know for each proposed thing. And as I sort of try to map out what's, you know, going on, I just, you know, OK, you know, what's the best solution there? Oh, it's the 2.1, you know, there. And, you know, I can go up the tree. And so I can figure out for those columns what is the most Republican, and here we are back in North Carolina and getting their nine seats, um, that uh, uh, what is the most Republican districting that's consistent with those plans and what is also the most Democratic. And that allows us to do a complete, and I know the back of the room you can't see this, but uh, this gives, allows us to do a state-by-state -state analysis of, of exactly what can be achieved. And, and you know, what's depicted here is sort of the most Democratic map that we can rule, most, the, the most Republican map how proportional we can get. We can't get actually proportional so much. But remember, all of these over maps that have compact districts. We built in compactness into how we built our, our district choices. And even with respect to these nice looking maps, nationwide, we can build in a 62 to 43 swing in terms of the percentage of expected democratic seats. So there's just. You know, if you want you know, to be convinced that the, that the map makers have enormous power, this is it. Um, you know, in terms of you know, being able to swap from, from, from the current plans. Um, but one depressing thing is that in terms of really being able to do what I showed you in North Carolina of get a proportional plan, not so easy. That they're it may be most extreme in the Massachusetts case, but there are lots of states where not only can you not get bang on proportionally, but, but even coming so close to proportionally is, is hard. Um, interesting enough, if you look at this as a different sampling mechanism for generating a distribution of maps, it has strong properties compared to what the MCMC folks do. They have, I have no idea what the distribution is. I'm making no claims to knowing what the distribution is. But there is a, you know, there is the properties of the distribution of the maps that we produce have interesting, some interesting qualities that the MCMC folks do, which, you know, in my bone to pick to them is they don't know what properties their distribution has either. Um, they're, they're, they're hoping that, 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 it, that it, in some sense, is reflective to the overall, in some sense, legitimate number. But, but, but that you know, is, is yet to be proved. 
We've worked on this in other contexts. We work with an NGO that was trying to o overturn some malfeasance on the Buffalo City Council. Um, and we spent some time this summer trying to participate in what was then an open feed of uh, put out by a new special master after a, oh, I won't use an impolite word, something match between the state legislature and, and, and the court system um, where the Supreme Court had thrown out the map that was used in 2022 for Alabama and there are new maps being produced. One of the things that the Supreme Court highlighted in their decision was that part of the reason they threw out that map is it didn't respect the integrity of the so-called Black Belt, which is a, a well-understood collection of counties that are highlighted here in red. Um, and part of what the experiment, the maps on the right show are uh, um, the fact that these are maps drawn to respect that, that, that the Black Belt is split only within two different districts. Um, this just gives you a sense of what racial diversity looks like in that, in terms of uh, how uh, integrate, you know, what the percentage of black votes, what the percentage of white voters are um, block by block. And so you, you can sort of understand why that might have been dubbed the black belt. Um, Alabama, so we didn't participate in the public competition um, for a new Alabama map because we discovered a bit too late that Alabama in the legislature in trying to still maintain control passed a law that said any districting plan had to conform to certain traditions within the state of Alabama. Now, they weren't the most obvious ones. And in some sense, if you work to conform to all of them, then you'd be left with the previously racially biased maps to some large extent. Um, and it's not clear, you know, again, the constitutionality of that law and whether they'll sue. I mean, I don't think we're done with Alabama yet. You know, we'll see where this ends. Um, but a, an important criterion that they put in, which the, we had added to our formulation, was how many counties are split in terms of being in multiple districts. And not only that, they say that if one county is trisected and has pieces in three different districts, that counts as two splits. Um, so, uh, and so by that, so we were, we put that into our objective function. We didn't put it as a constraint. Um, and we, we, were, we knew we, look, from our own look at tradition in Alabama, we were looking to that, but, but the best of our maps only had nine um, county splits. And so we thought oh, they're gonna throw this out for sure because that's an easy one to check. It, it's, it's rationalizable. Many states, Iowa um, in particular, for example, requires that no county should get split, which is actually much easier. That's really easy to incorporate within our framework. And we're looking to ways to think about, as you think about that concept of state, as applied to the recursive composition to really think about an allowed number of, of, of county splits so as to actually be able to manage that in the overall decomposition process. So that, that's what I want to say about sort of the main architecture of, uh, of the tool that we're ongoingly trying to build and indeed we're trying to then, there, there are any number of nuanced, smaller constraints that part of the beauty of the set partitioning formulation is that you can incorporate things like this, you know, side constraint that says the airport should be in the same district as, 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 as where um, another source of tax base is. And so we want that in the same district. And so we just, you know, fix certain edges that have to actually be in this, you know, that, 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 that as, as you do the partitioning, those variables have to agree. And so they're easy, you know, easy ways of, 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 of putting in all kinds of different side constraints that naturally happen. So I wanna to turn to challenge number two and spend the last 10 minutes or so talking about it. And this was motivated by a piece of legislation which is in an earlier Congress and just died a cruel death in the well of the, of the House, but proposed that ranked choice voting be used for all elections 
um, for the House of Representatives, that states entitled to six or more representatives establish districts so that three to five representatives are collectively representing one multi-member district. If it's five or fewer, then we don't subdivide. Okay, so, so it's this notion of a multi-member district and there's this layer of, of, of uh, ranked choice voting as well. And so one question is, we have tools to explore the question of, you know, does it, is this idea good? Does it make sense? What, what are its impacts? Um, and so one question is, if I'm going to be, I take a group of N people and they're electing um, three, rep or three representatives, let's say, how do we do that? So, I mean, in some sense, the, the, the US Constitution embodies that uh, on a statewide basis in the Senate. That, okay, they don't happen at the same time, but statewide, you know, we choose, or most of the time it's at different times, um, you know, the, the population chooses two leaders to represent them. And that's sort of, well, we just run separate elections and winner take all in each of them. And we'll see that's horrible. Um, but here's a much more sophisticated notion, well studied in the social choice literature, known as single transferable vote, which basically says that candidates are not elected independently and that we're going to use ranked choice voting in a subtle way so as to run such an election. And I want to use this table and hopefully even the numbers are viewed are visible from the back. Um, so ranked choice voting, let's think about how it gets used for the mayoralty in San Francisco or the mayoralty in New York. What happens is everyone submits their ranked choice does, we ask the question, does somebody have a majority of all the votes cast? No? Take the low person, and I was correct, I was told the last time I gave this talk, you shouldn't say the low person in the totem pole, because the low, per low person on the totem pole is actually the most powerful one. So take the person with the fewest votes um, and say, okay, you're out of the running. Um, and now look at all of those ballots and who did they vote for next and redistribute and iterate until someone has a majority. So that's all well and good when I'm choosing one person, but how am I, let's say I'm choosing three people. And the answer is gonna be, we're gonna do, have two mechanisms, and two mechanisms that ensure that everyone has some really real efficacy in their vote. So here's round one, and Armando gets 27.2% of the vote. So he has more than a quarter in this election to choose three representatives. Well, there can't be four people who end up with more than a quarter. So he must be in the top three. So just as majority was the lock-in in the single leader, more than a quarter is the lock-in if I'm choosing three. So he's assigned his seat. But he only needed 25% to get that lock. So let's take that excess, that surplus, that really in some sense didn't have the power to, to, to affect the outcome, and give them another chance at someone lower on their list. Now the question is, so I have to take 2.2% of the votes and redistribute it. So which 2.2%? All of a sudden I'm gonna do this fractionally. I'm gonna redistribute proportionately to where the second choice, the next choices went for all of Armando's votes and redistribute those votes fractionally amongst those other candidates. And that's what happens next. Nobody has, nobody new has a quarter anymore. So now the least vote getter gets thrown out. We now do the simple redistribution there that all of those vote, you know, the, 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 those candidates have an actual ballot. We know who's next and we do this and we just keep going until ultimately there are three people with more than a quarter. Okay, so that's single transferable vote. And a kind of informal folk theorem is that up to rounding, this generates things that are proportional. So if I'm selecting two people that it has to, devi the, the split has to deviate and it's strict according to party lines and things like that, you have to split worse than zero between a third and two thirds in the extreme in order to capture zero or two seats that otherwise you're gonna split 50-50. Um, and you know, if it's three, then, then, then you know, it's, it's 
again, the top quartile and the bottom quartile that, that, that cause a, a, a uneven split, but otherwise thing there. So, and, and computational, this is easy to implement. So you could say, okay, well, aren't we just done? You know, why, why, don't we, why, why, do, why do we, if we're gonna do all of this, let's just have statewide vote. But of course, that goes away from this tradition of locality. And, you know, imagine in California that you have to cast, you know, a, a vote, a rank order, have, you know, for everyone statewide. So that's not going to be a, a it's not a natural solution. So what we did is what we wanted to understand, if I focus on relatively small multi-member districts, what are the outcomes? And sort of thinking about both twos and threes in terms of the, 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 what, what I mean by multi-member districts. And in some sense, there are two immediate takeaways. One is that the majority, the proportionality driver of single transferable vote within a district makes maps partisan gerrymandering resistant. And that's very intuitive, and I'll show you some of the data to back that up, that, 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 uh, um, that, that that's one thing. And in addition, because we have this extra flexibility, that we're able actually to generate maps for which the expected outcome is now proportional across all 50 states. So both of the challenges um, are affected. Um, let's look at some data. Um, so here and is that, and there's sort of the single transferable vote and, and another uh, proportion approval voting um, are more or less equivalent. That what, what, what I'm depicting here is what happens if I average across all 50 states of what the, that, remember in the one district kind, we, we, we went from something that was like 60% to something that was 40%. Um, roughly, um, it was, anyway, you can see the numbers there. Um, red being Republican, blue being Democratic, in terms of if we were the single member district. But if we just go to two member districts, then already the extent to which averaged over what happened statewide, the amount that that gap of how much the bias of partisanship can build in, that gets narrowed. And by the time you're down to three, it's really very much coming under control. So collectively, we're able to, to ensure that, that the overall map could. So remember, I, we talked about winner take all. This is what winner takes all looks like in comparison. It's just, you know, that, that locks in the, the, the tyranny of, of, the, of the slight majority um, in, in, a, in, a, in a qualitative way. And in particular, that we can do this on a state by state basis. Let's come back to Massachusetts. Um, that uh, if we think about the range, so, so this is to reflect the most Republican map and the most Democratic map if we have so many districts overall. So like if I look at um, three districts, so three three-person districts, you can see that I don't see you, that you don't see the red dot because it's underneath the blue dot, um, that, that, that we actually can, can achieve exactly proportionality um, overall, so. So, so tremendous effect in being able to do that. Um, that. And again, the extent to which we can achieve proportionality, so that was much of how much we can inhibit um, partisanship, but in the extent to which we can, you know, what that proportionality gap looks like in percent um, goes down to something like under 0.2% in terms of the proportionality gap that can be achieved. Now, I will advocate for three... Um, member seats because one thing about two member seats is that one of the pluses of single transferable vote becomes its minus, negatives. That it takes a lot to, you know, it takes more than that one third, two third split in order for it not to go one one. And so if we have two member districts, there is no incentive for the parties to put up candidates that are the slight bit reasonable. They're going to get the, the, the split that they want. And so we're gonna, that would be a system that would naturally head towards extremes. And it would be interesting to think about ways that we could qualitatively model things. Um, so 
you know, our recommendations that coming out of the analysis is that three member districts are effective in mitigating uh, gerrymandering, that larger districts um, might be needed in smaller and more partisan states. And, you know, I did say this is pie in the sky. It's not a complete pipe dream. Uh, okay, it's a very progressive city in a very progressive state, but Portland, Oregon implemented exactly this mechanism for their city council. Um, but, but this actually just opens a whole range of, of related questions of sort of this interplay between social choice mechanisms and the kind of optimization that we're doing under, underneath it. And, you know, one, you know, designing solutions for the current situation, one has to be cognizant of the downstream effects. And one interesting question is, what does this do to the impact of the emergence of, you know, the U.S. becoming a more normal system in other respects that there might even be th viable third parties. Um, and and so, so there are interesting questions of how to think about what a given proposal does in, in, in respect to that. So, so, I mean, I really think that there are a host of interesting computational questions that are underlying this. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, we have time so, for some questions. If you want to ask a question, just raise your hand and I'll get the mic over to you. Steve. Uh, so I, I think there's an issue, at least in some states, with the U.S. voting system that um, it, it, for some voters in, in primaries, it pays to them for them to be strategic and vote for somebody whom they don't really support in order to influence the candidates in the general election, right? Uh, so um, this, do you have any, anything to say about that problem with U.S. voting? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 Other questions? So you mentioned that 10 states have adopted some sort of uh, MMDs. Like, do you know what for, for what level of government? Or uh, at the, at the, at, well, that was meant with respect to state legislature. Wow, okay. But the bad point, you know, is the thing is, those were winner take all MMDs. Um, so, you know, really, it is tyranny of the minority. I might with a slight majority. Do you have any thoughts on where like it'll go in the future with MMD? Do you, are more people proposing legislation for this? Yeah. Or? So so there are a number of NGOs that that put it at the top of um, uh, so one that I've been working with uh, has a really clever name of Fix Us, um, um, and uh, that's high on their list of of ways in which they think you know are campaigning for structural change. Um, I my my own naive political view is that we need, well, there are several ingredients. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, the state of Maine does all of its elections with ranked choice voting. So one of the, 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 the issues is getting people used to ranked choice voting. Um, New York City did the world a great disservice in how they executed um, ranked choice voting in the last mayoral election. Um, Partly, de Blasio was mayor, and he tried to explain ranked choice voting in terms of kinds of pizza. <laughs> and, and this just fell really flat. But more to the point, one technical oddity is that in the way reporting of votes is done on election night and following, is that votes get counted at different speeds. And so you actually can't do redistribution of ranked choice votes and have any sense there until you actually have computed all of them. And all kinds of news outlets and other entities that should know better started making statements about what was happening based on votes that were counted election night, not thinking about the total pool, and all of a sudden, Weird things happened. This wasn't the way we expected. We, but it was really a question of, and we know, you know, from certainly the history of the last five years has shown that the the electorates are wildly different in terms of the mechanisms by which they vote, and they get counted at different speeds. And this gives a, a, a very much a sense of public disease, dis ease. Um, 
uh, missy, I don't know, you know, discomfort, let's say, uh, um, um, as a function of not knowing how to trust um, things. So, so I think that there is, there is actually a, an, a, 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 an information question about how you do things. Um, one solution, which there are strong advocates for, are that we should clamp down on how much partial precinct release, you know, votes are released. Certainly, New York as a city is discussing this because they understand that they're sort of only reporting information that is largely meaningless. And, and, and with the, I mean, I mean, I'm a news junkie, so I mean, I, I, I certainly watch Steve Kornacki at the big board and, and, and try to understand, um, you know, what he is or isn't telling us in terms of, and they're getting much better at sort of knowing as you're getting returns, which precincts are reporting, what do you know historically about the precincts that aren't reporting, and trying to understand where is in this partial collection of votes gonna end up. But, but this brings a whole different dimension in terms of how it plays out because you have this runoff piece. And so I think at one level, getting the US, I think ranked choice voting is a good thing. I think it does actually allow people to vote, to express for their dissatisfaction with candidates who actually end up winning while still supporting people who end up more aligned than others. So I think in terms of a, a, a democratization force, in terms of not necessarily the outcome, but at least people feeling where their voice is heard in, in a minority, it, it is a mechanism for that. So I'm, I'm very pro-ranked choice voting overall. That's one element, but I also think that if you're going to do multi-member districts, the way to do it is exactly the way Portland did it, Palm Springs is looking at it as well. There are a number of places that are looking at the local level, and I think feeding that up from a local level and getting people to feel comfort that this is, this is achieving the ends that they really want. Any other questions? I think maybe you can have one quick question. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm also a big fan of mixed member or a single transferable vote. And, uh, you know, you, you're talking about all the ways in which sort of litigators and policymakers are referencing your work. Um, I kind of wonder from a research ethics point of view, you know, if you make an algorithm that makes kind of a bad policy system, i.e. the current winner takes all system, more palatable or more fair, you know, there's a risk that basically that takes some of the wind out of the sails of some of these proposals to just move to a better system. Kind of. What's your philosophy on this sort of research ethics problem? Well, as you see, I'm, I'm trying to have my cake and eat it too. I'm talking about the better solution concurrently with trying to say that we can help a fair-minded independent, you know, independent commission that wants to be proactive or a litigant that, 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 that really wants to point out the flaws in, in an in a enacted plan. Um, and to really give the range of choices. But I agree that there, there's, a, there's a tension between that. It's a question of trying to have solutions that maybe help in the next 10 years versus solutions that might help 30 or four. I, I don't believe, I mean, I, I, would, I think it's a longer, slower cultural change to go to something like multi-member. Multi I mean, there could be an earthquake that happens um, politically um, that calls it. I mean, there are other earthquakes that I fear even more, but uh, that, uh, um, that, that, uh, um, that I think is a longer term agenda. And I think sort of ke you know, keeping in mind that, that, that there, there are different trajectories for different kinds of immediacy of where you want to have impact. Um, that, that I think that working both tracks does serve a greater collective end, even if there are risks in doing it. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we'll take, uh other questions at the reception. So I just wanted to remind everyone that there's a reception right across in the lounge. And uh, let's, with that, let's thank uh, David again for an excellent talk.